So, good afternoon. So, as it was already announced, so this is a special, special uh, uh, panel discussion. And I hope you do not expect us to discuss our three, to discuss for one hour. So, we are definitely waiting for input from you. But maybe it's good when we introduce ourselves at the beginning. My name is Marek Kusch. I was a Humboldt fellow. I, I am a Humboldt fellow, but I started my, 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 my adventure with, with Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation and many, many years ago. Because I, I came to Germany at that time, it was, uh, I think it was 84 or 85, okay? 85 actually, I started it formally. So it was long ago. And uh, I spent nearly two years as a finance, financed by Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation. And maybe in a second I will tell you what are my best experience out of that. But let me pass now to, to the, my colleagues. Uh, OK. As, as it were already said this morning, my name is Mart Sausage. And uh, actually, my story about uh, Humboldt Foundation is uh, quite unusual in the sense that I never uh, have been uh, received grants for Humboldt Foundation, but was uh, involved with uh, Humboldt Foundation in a totally different way. And probably this is, is intrigue, and, and we will be uh, going to the uh, concrete stories, I will disclose how I get involved with Humboldt Foundation, why I'm considered Humboldtian, why I have similar tie like uh, Gediminas with all this uh, Humboldtian inscriptions. So Humboldt Foundation considers me as a real Humboldtian, but I never was, uh, I never received grant from Humboldt Foundation. This is tricky in intrigue. So my name is Florian Minter, and I have like probably like a very common history with, uh, with Humboldt. I uh, received a Peter uh, Lund Fellowship, so I did my uh, postdoc uh, financed by, uh, by Humboldt. And uh, yeah, also that's uh, kind of a while ago. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, most of my academic life, I have actually been a Humboldtian. So yeah, pretty much I don't even know how it is to not be a Humboldtian. Okay, so let's go to some, some, to some concrete. So I think that it's especially interesting, it could be the discussion, if we find a resonance in the audience, uh, just because of this fact that, that there are at least, there are several dimensions of, 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 of uh, being Humboldtian, okay? So one dimension is that there are this obvious one, okay, so that we differ <coughs> with respect to countries of our origin, and this also can somehow influence the experience of, of working uh, uh, in Germany or outside of Germany, but being financed by Alexander von Humboldt. And the second thing is there are several, I would say, connections, as, we, as you heard. So I am, I would say, ordinary Humboldt fellow. As I, as I told you, I came to, to Germany in 84. Uh, this is probably from this part of, from this part of Europe at that time. And in, in the, yes, so for the people of my generation. So it was probably one of the first, or first sometimes, but one of the first definitely experience of being somehow beyond the Iron Curtain. I would not go into details, but there was also some formal difficulties to do that at that time. But <clears throat> when successful, so definitely it was the first time uh, for me that I was for a longer time, okay? Broad and started to work. And for the obvious reasons, okay, so there were obvious reasons why it was so, so attractive, okay, so good financing, good, good position, uh, uh, fantastic uh, environment, and so on. But uh, this is probably obvious for everybody. So for me, what was actually the most important thing was the possibility of uh, actually of. Uh, Founding, uh, of finding many contacts, even not at the place when I work. So I ruthlessly used the possibilities of, of, of uh, 
visiting different places in Germany and outside of Germany, also in, in England and France, and to make contacts with a, with a different group of, of scientists. And this paid in a sense, so this was, the, I would say, the, 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 the particular gain I, I, I appreciate very much from this, from this year of being Alexander von Humboldt uh, Fellow and working as Alexander von Humboldt Fellow in Germany. Uh, why it was so important? Because at some, uh, uh, at many uh, points in my, my scientific life, I had the opportunity to change a little bit or little, even more my my area of interest. Okay, so and this was mostly, I would say, when when then I thought about this, uh, initiated by my contacts with different uh, uh, groups in in Germany. Uh, not only in Germany, but in Germany, but f uh, somehow uh, which was enabled by, 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 by financing from Alexander von Humboldt. So, so this was, this is, this is, this is something which I would say the, the, as, as a question, uh, a question which is the title question of our, how being Humboldtian influenced my life. So obviously scientific life. So, so this was for me the most important, and I think that this kind of experience everybody has a little bit different, okay? And this would be also very interesting to hear from you. What are this uh, very specific, not so this obvious? Okay, this obvious is also very interesting to hear. How come that that somebody uh, became an Alexander von Humboldt fellow, or co this connection to Alexander von Humboldt Foundation? But uh, for me, it's interesting what are this really this long time uh, results of this. So for me, as I told you, so the many contacts which I somehow started at that time. So um, what I can also say is that, that uh, why I think it's interesting, because uh, this could also somehow, I think that foundation could be also interesting. Uh, I, uh, had some interest in the, in the results of our discussion. Just they also want to learn what is really important for us and what is good and maybe some, some, sometimes bad, although there were not so bad things in my case. But to, 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 to somehow to, to know how to, how to do it. I understand that, that the, this scheme of financing and also I would say uh, the uh, main areas or may I, may, may, main areas in world from, from the, the, the most of Alexander von Humboldt fellows, this ordinary Alexander von Humboldt fellows, <laughs> as, as me, come now, changes for natural reasons and for different reasons. So it'd be also very interesting to, for me to, to, to somehow induce you to, to say, to, to, to have an input from, from, from the people from different countries, how it looks like. Okay, so maybe. Yeah, probably I should now disclose how I became uh, Humboldtian. Uh, actually, it happened many, many years ago. Uh, probably you know uh, Wilhelm Hanley. Uh, I guess that he's one of the absolutely first researchers who started to, to explore uh, quantum coherence. His first paper, I guess, is coming from 1924, uh, when he started to publish about, about Hanley effect. It's a moment when quantum mechanics in the uh, present shape only started to uh, appear. And when I was uh, finishing university, I was, it happens that I, I was finishing university in Latvia, in outskirts of Europe at that time, definitely. Um, and I was starting to study uh, Hanley effect. Hanley effect in small molecules, in diatomic molecules, and was publishing, publishing my results sometimes in big international journals, but as it used to be at that time, sometimes in uh, rather local journals, including journals published in uh, Latvia. And at some point I was uh, very much surprised and starting to get requests from Wilhelm Hanle to uh, send him uh, preprints of these papers. Uh, again, probably not everybody in this audience knows and remembers time when there was no internet. There was 
uh, impossible to find uh, papers on, on the web. Uh, usually you are browsing journals, and if journals at that time were not so kind of uh, mainstream journals, like journals published in Latvia, you are browsing some kind of catalogs of uh, papers which were published. And then there was a hab habit, there was pre pre printed cards. You are sending a request cards to somebody that I uh, saw in catalog. Uh, your paper, it seems by title very interesting, could you send me a reprint? And we were sending these reprints, and I was starting to send uh, reprints to uh, Wilhelm Hanley. He was asking for them. Uh, then somehow we uh, got in correspondence, and uh, again, probably you know many uh, German professors even not now, at the end of the years, are sending uh, out to his uh, colleagues and friends kind of uh, report what happened during that particular year. Happened, what happened in science, what happened in their personal life. And uh, Wilhelm Hanles uh, was sending out not just a couple of pages, it was small booklets. Each year I received and still have with his signature and kind of, of dedication these uh, small booklets which was sent to my office. And so in this way I started to be involved this, with German physicist, with, with uh, Wilhelm Hanle. And uh, then at some point, I guess that it was an in initiative from Hanley uh, himself. He decided that he should establish Hanley Award. Uh, and this probably, and now we are coming to uh, Humboldt Foundation, and probably it shows how flexible Humboldt Foundation usually and always uh, have been. Uh, probably there is one kind of very uh, kind of specific situation. Uh, I don't think that I will be disclosing family secrets, but I, I guess at, at that time, son of Wilhelm Hanley was one of the science officers in the uh, Humboldt Foundation. And I guess that uh, why his son, uh, Hanley, convinced Humboldt Foundation to establish this one-time uh, Hanley Award. And again, I don't know all the details, but. I suspect that Hanley uh, single-handedly, in some sense, decided who will be getting this Hanley Award, uh, because it was Hanley Award. And then I got this award. It was end of 80s, beginning of 90s, previous century. And then what happened after that? Uh, it was not just kind of check or paycheck or money. It was um, much more than that and influenced my uh, career much, much more than that. Uh, because then we organized in Riga, I guess it was uh, ECAMP conference around 1990. Uh, and uh, this award in a form of three PC computers was bought to Riga, to Latvia. And we got these three PC computers in my lab and now it seems PC computer, what does it mean? At that time, even in Western Europe, PC computers only started to appear like, like ordinary instrument on your table. I got my PC on my table. I was able to do some simulation cell calculations, but actually the uh, um, influence of that computer was much more than that. Because at that time, emails appeared. Again, probably not everybody remembers time when there was no emails. I remember in Latvia how it happened. We had Institute of Computer Science, and there was one terminal at the doors of the director of institute. And everybody from the university was going to that particular place to receive emails and to send emails. And then I got my PC, and I got email program very simple, there was no these nice shells. You are uh, like in, in Unix uh, way, put in all these commands, but I got email. Why it was important? Uh, 1990s, it's a moment when uh, Europe started to open. And the European Commission decided to have some joint programs with these uh, newly uh, appearing countries and uh, old Western European countries. And some grants were supposed to have uh, obligatory some partners from Eastern Europe. And it appeared it's not so trivial, because as you know, always when you are uh, writing grant, grant, grant proposals, you are writing them in the last moment. Uh, it's always not enough time. And it appeared that some people from Italy at that uh, time decided to write this type of grant proposal, and they needed partner in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Otherwise, they cannot submit this grant proposal. And uh, 
you can imagine, if there is no email, you cannot get uh, partners very quickly. Uh, but if you have email, then you can do it really quickly. And I, I again, suspect that one of the main reasons why we got on this project and uh, why, why I got my first European grant in this way was because I had this PC computer and has email. And then everything started and now I continue on and on because uh, then uh, collaboration with different, uh, even uh, including uh, Humboldt partners I had for many years constantly, but probably these are already not so uh, interesting details and are more typical details, but this was the beginning and this was my involvement with, involvement with uh, Humboldt Foundation. Well, I think that's a very uh, um, influential uh, moment for your life. I mean, I think my story is again not as uh, exciting. I mean, evidently, I got my uh, my uh, postdoc fellowship uh, financed by Humboldt, which um, allowed me um, to see quite some of the world, to learn many uh, new things. That's probably similar to uh, to Marek's experience. And evidently, I mean that. Um, helped a lot my scientific development, but then I would say, well, there's many other funding agencies, so I probably could have uh, received the funding from some other funding agencies, or other people receive it from other funding agencies. So I would not say that this is actually the big impact that Humboldt had on me. I think the bigger aspect is probably the people that I met uh, because I was affiliated with Humboldt. I mean, our meeting here is one example, but uh, already when I was a postdoc, I attended several meetings um, with uh, mostly uh, Humboldians or people invited by, by Humboldt Foundation. And this is all people that I would not have met uh, otherwise. And I mean, there was often was people in a similar situation as me, just having received the PhD now, uh, somewhere out in the world doing a postdoc. And I think discussing with them, hearing about their experiences, hearing about their plans, what they wanted to do after their postdoc, what was their idea for their personal development, I think that's something that also helped me a lot, really coming up with uh, a plan for my life, how I wanted uh, to, uh, to develop. And I think, yeah, that's not the type of, um, the type of input that I would have gotten from a, a senior supervisor. I think that was really, I mean, the big uh, aspect of meeting other people um, in a similar situation to mine. And yeah, that was during the postdoc, and then afterwards uh, there were many other meetings where I met other people uh, again, which had a similar impact on my life. And I would really say, I mean, meeting people, that's for me probably the biggest advantage that uh, Humboldt has uh, given to me. And I saw Maciek was offering some input, so I'm very happy to stop here. Uh, I wanted to also start with the memories, so to say, and I would like to remind you that in the 80s, Europe did not exist in the scientific sense. All this European network that European Union has started to finance started in the 90s and in the beginning of the 21st century. Okay, Europe in scientific sense of networking did not exist. The only mobility postdoc program which existed at that time in the 80s in Europe was the Humboldt. That was the only thing, or United States. If we uh, wanted to go for postdoc, we could only apply in the States or for Humboldt stipendium. And uh, in fact, this is what we did. As you know, from the Eastern Europe, most of the countries were closed and you couldn't go out. Only Hungary and Poland at that time was relatively open. And I think that huge percentage of the postdoc stipends at that time were actually uh, filled by the people from Poland and uh, Hungary. We can check the statistics, but this is what I remember, okay? My way to Germany was not through Humboldt. I was a student of Kazik Zonczewski. I went for six months as a Deutsche Akademische Austausch uh, student for six months to Essen. And then this uh, martial law in Poland started. So I 
Fritz kindly, uh, Fritz Hacke overtook the uh, supervision of my thesis and I stayed uh, three uh, or two and a half years more in, in Germany uh, simply as a Wissenschaftliche assistant, so on the position offered by Fritz. But, of course, um, uh, sooner or later I started to use or even abuse, I would say, Humboldt uh, Foundation because since 1998 I was professor in Hanover. And of course, during the stay in Hanover, I had at least, uh, if I remember now, three postdocs who were fantastic. Aditi Sende, Ujwal uh, Sen, and Bogdan Damski. Bogdan is now, Bojo Damski is now professor in Krakow. The Indian pair ca came with me to build my group in Barcelona in 2005, and they played absolutely essential role in that. But they spent before two years as uh, Humboldtians in Hanover. And even more importantly, I was a host or co-host of uh, senior Humboldt. Uh, prize winners, which were uh, Peter Zoller, uh, Kazik, I think, spent, uh, spent part of his Humboldt in Hanover, uh, and Zora, of course. Yes? So this was absolutely amazing for the scientific, uh, 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 scientific situation in Hanover. This was absolutely essential. I would say. And now, of course, in, in, in Barcelona, again, I had at least Two, if not more, Feodor Linen stipendist. Also, Luis Santos. Sofia Kovalevskaya is Humboldt? Okay, Luis Santos got the Sofia Kovalevskaya when he was in Hanover, and this was first step to his individual uh, uh, scientific uh, career. He got then C3 professor in Stuttgart and then became main Nachfolger in Hanover. So, please share with us your experience. Who's next? Sure. Uh, you know, I decided to say a couple of words because Maciek, in his wonderful speech, mentioned the city of Hanover. And uh, the city of Hanover Mm, it's, uh, it's the place which is associated with my Humboldt Prize, which I got in 1998. And people behind this prize were Maciek, who just became a professor in Hanover, Martin Wilkins, and Jürgen Mlinek. Yes? So I was supposed to, to go in Germany to Potsdam, to Constance, and to Hanover. I was going to all these places, but the most active and efficient collaboration was in Hanover, yes. I have split up my price into, I guess, five years, and, and then, so until 2003, when I got a position in Orsa, this director de recherche position at CNRS, and then, but what was happening after that? That the collaboration with Hanover, it was continuing when Maciek was there, then Maciek left, and I was collaborating with Luis Santos, who actually replaced Maciek in Hanover, and I still collaborate with Hanover. So this story is 20 years long, and I would say that what the Humboldt Prize gave me, as I give aside from giving finances and possibility to go to Germany and so on, it gave me the second home because, and, and this is the city of Hanover, yes, where I go every year, yes, and I c collaborate with the theory department and, and the collaboration is continuing even now. For example, right now, I'm writing a paper with Hanover people and they're blaming me that I'm far too slow. I guess that they are right, but okay. So I would say that there are many circumstances and many people say, can say very many words what Humboldt Foundation gave them. For me, 
the Humboldt Foundation gave me my second home. Thank you. Any other comments, experiences? In 1989, I was a postdoc working in molecular spectroscopy and combustion research. And I realized that, yes, applied research was very motivating and you really realize you help society for some urgent problems. But I realized that I rather wanted to do some more fundamental physics and wanted to change my field. So I considered switching to atomic physics and cold atoms and I applied to various places in the United States but uh, I couldn't secure a position unless I had a fellowship. So I applied for a Feodor Lunen fellowship and when I got the approval for the Feodor Lunen fellowship in probably early 1990 I knew I could realize my goals and learning atomic physics and cold atom science in the United States. So eventually it was a Feodor Lunen Fellowship which led me to MIT. I teamed up with Dave Pritchard as a mentor and this was really a decisive stage in my career. Hi, I'm Yi Xin Chen. I come from Taiwan. Gedi Minutes gave me the opportunity to share my personal experience um, because I just got a position this year. And so I can say something about my, my work and my experience. And I joined Humboldt family in 2014, just four years ago. So I'm happy to see so many brother and sister maybe. <laughs> and father, <laughs> and um, so first of all, uh, I think Humboldt, Humboldtia helped me to find a good job, and and I am the youngest professor in my department, so it's a great honor for me, and and as I know, as a um, many female researcher need to quit their job because they have um, family duty. And I think Humboldt Foundation provide a very good benefit for Humboldtian family because um, um, my husband can take care of my children. And, but however, uh, I need to terminate my fellowship half a year earlier because of the family duty. Um, and I, okay. And about my research, uh, I think my PhD supervisor and uh, um, postdoc host it has a very different uh, leading uh, style. And so they give me a good model to teach me how to become a good professor. And I also find another research interesting when I stay in Germany. And when I stay in Germany, I think I open the international perspective. So I think uh, if um, I do good in my research job, I hope I can back to Germany to take a sabbatical a few years later. That's okay, my share, my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have not the story, but the question. I also have a story, but the question is more interesting. So this is not the first Humboldt colleague I participate. So you know that there are in big scientific center Humboldt clubs. In particular, in Novosibirsk, in Siberia, there is very big Humboldt clubs. And it's time to time, maybe something, every second year, it's organized a Humboldt colleagues with some talks, but the main, I would say, activity this is barbecue, drinking wine, meeting the friends, because the conferences usually is multidisciplinary. So 
if I, I see this audience, I listen to a talk of some economists, which is interesting maybe for general education, but does not help to, to your own mm, problem. So question to you, Kiddenis. How did you manage to collect all the whole world, the researchers who is doing more or less the same things, and at the same time a humble fellow? So how it works technically? How do you know that I was a humble fellow, for example? Could you answer this question? Yes, I guess for you. <laughs> Which? How I get this information? <laughs> oh, it is, uh, I can share the secret. Uh, so, when I sent invitations, actually, you know that there is a chain reaction like in nuclear chains. So essentially it was like a new, probably many of you when you got invitations, um, there was something like, if you know other Humboldtians, please let me know. And actually it worked very well because we, uh, uh, from the list which we had, uh, probably only half of the Humboldtians came. And in the future, probably tomorrow will be disclosed that this is not the last Humboldt collect we're planning somewhere else. It's just keep secret yeah, uh, in some time. And, um, they ca we can use this um, uh, list. Actually, uh, about you, Andre, I think uh, we knew that you were Humboldtians, but in some cases it came like surprise, like Evgeny Sherman, uh, we invited him, and after that we found out that he is, uh, we invited him as an expert, but we found him he also a Humboldtian, so it was a, a few surprises quite. Yeah, so this list, uh, when you go to Humboldt webpage, you can search people. And uh, if you type a name, it shows whether it is Humboldtian or not. So, so this is not a big secret. I don't know whether you need to connect the via I, Humboldt ID or it's just open. Maybe it's just open. So if you know the person, you can check. So eventually at the end of the day, I just checked. Like Christoph Weinterberg, also it was a pleasant surprise because first we invited him like uh, Christian Weinterberg, but he appears as a Humboldtian, Lunan fellow Christian, but Christoph Weinterberg. So that's, that's that's the life. Uh, yes, essentially our first uh, goal was that people should be relevant to, uh, to, to, to this colleague, and uh, yes, and then we checked, yes. But in some cases we knew, of course I knew that uh, Ivo is Humboldt fellow, because when I myself, not fellow, award winner, because when I myself was a um, Humboldt fellow in the uh, University of Ulm, uh, it was 97, 98, and then I spent summers 99, 99 2000. Uh, I used to live in Kloster Wiblingen, which was guest house of a uh, very nice place, and uh, I used to drive bicycle, and I remember Eva and his daughter also used to drive bicycle, because he also spent summers in, in a group of uh, von Hanschleich, and I was in a group of Peter Reinecke. At that time I was a little bit in different area working exotons, but uh, Contacts with the uh, people of um, Peter, um, Volume Schleich actually shifted my career, and that's why probably I'm here in this Cold Atom conference. Because otherwise, if not being Humboldtian, I probably would, would do something different. Yeah. So thank you very much. And actually, maybe I would like to ask Eva, maybe. You can share. Well, uh, it has already been mentioned by Magic Levenstein, uh, how Humboldt Foundation managed to operate in our part of Europe before the breakdown of the system. One can compare Humboldt with Fulbright Foundation, for example, which played a similar role. However, there was a tremendous difference. Humboldt avoided the political decisions to mix up with the judgment of those who wanted to invite some scientists. Fulbright allowed to have joint Polish-American commission that finally decided who is going to obtain the Fulbright Fellowship, whereas Humboldt has never been involved in anything like that. 
And I even wonder what was behind this, because the relations between Poland and Germany were very delicate for various reasons. I mean, we border with Germany, and there was, of course, many problems that were raised by the communist regime. And I remember, for example, that on several occasions I could not go to Germany because there was some upside down political situation. Polish bishops wrote something about <laughs> trying to, to ease the tensions between Poland and Germany. And of course, our leaders were shocked. And I do remember very definitely that for a few weeks, all trips, scientific trips, to Germany were forbidden. But Humboldt somehow avoided the involvement, and as far as I can tell from my experience, they never allowed the political element to be decisive who goes to Germany on Humboldt Foundation or not. Of of course, one would like to mention, since I am here, probably the oldest participant, that Humboldt had a very interesting starting point, especially when it comes to Humboldt Awards. That was a way for Germans to say thank you for the Marshall Plan. And they decided, and this is how it operated at the beginning, that Humboldt Awards were given to Americans only. And of course, the treatment was then very, very nice. Humboldt awardees came to Germany, and they were given a BMW to drive. I remember conversation with Marlon Scully, who was one of the Humboldt awardees before Humboldt opened up for the rest of the world. And this was really a very, very nice treatment that they received here. Thank you very much. Do we have other experiences? We had uh, many comments from the more senior people here with very interesting uh, perspectives from uh, different political times. Uh, it would be interesting to also hear from some of the younger people maybe who currently hold their first Tombolt Fellowship or have recently done so. Of course, I consider myself young, so I <laughs> say something now. Um, so I, when I um, did uh, finish my PhD and I wanted to go to Paris to Jean Dalibar, and he said, yes, we have a uh, experiment to work on, but we don't have money. And um, then um, he suggested that we uh, apply for Humboldt and then it worked out with this Fyodor Lunen, which is very nice and of course was very important for uh, my career. I just want to uh, add perhaps this thought because there was this comparison to the uh, European Union fundings that are now available as well, like um, Marie Curie actions for this kind of exchange of postdocs that um, the ex uh, advantage of uh, Humboldt is, of course, that it's much more flexible. It, they, they have a panel every three times a year, so uh, we also played for Marie later, but then it's once a year, and if you're not the right turn, that, that will not be a so, so I think it's, that's a very, very good point for the flexibility. I also don't know anything about the official success rates, but it's also kind of my impression that Humboldt is orders of magnitudes higher. Maybe not. Any other comments? Experiences? Yeah, so maybe not so much in experience perhaps, but I think it's, it's great to hear the, uh, the stories of, uh, uh, especially our older colleagues, uh, because it, it shows that Humboldt Foundation has been really decisive in some cases, uh, especially for the people behind the former uh, Iron Curtain. And uh, now that um, the Iron Curtain is no longer there and there's more opportunities for European funding and uh, 
many of these former uh, Iron Curtain countries are now part of Europe. It seems to me that, um, that there should be a new role for the Humboldt Foundation. They should be sort of reposition themselves, perhaps. Uh, in, my, in my own case, I cannot truly say if the Humboldt Fellowship was really decisive. I mean, I was uh, from, uh, from uh, it was in the 90s, and um, I was from a Western Europe country, so I, I cannot truly say that my, my uh, opportunities were that limited. Uh, but, but Humboldt did allow me to go to Germany, and, and it was a great place to be, because it was the uh, former group of Jürgen Blinek at the time uh, in Konstanz. And I, it, so it, apart from being a great place to be, I was exposed to the German uh, scientific culture, and that was also great. But it seems to be that, that uh, Humboldt uh, maybe should find, let's say, a new role now that these less uh, or these countries behind the Iron Curtain, for instance, are less uh, limited in their opportunities. And so what, so what I do really appreciate is that Humboldt sort of fosters this idea of a Humboldt family. And so if, if, if anything, I would say that they should keep doing that and perhaps do it even more strongly. For example, I was, I'm also, I was also a fellow from a different foundation and they organize these days every year uh, where people from very different uh, fields of science or even uh, humanities I guess they gather and they spend a day of uh, discussing some societal topic you know uh, last year it was I think it was related to fake news and how we can how we should deal with that as scientists and uh, yeah what we can do in this debate and so on. So it's just an idea that, that uh, yeah, Humboldt could, could even more strongly foster this family uh, idea. I don't know if there's going to be any sort of feedback to the Humboldt. Uh, <laughs> is this? Actually, I don't know whether it will be feedback, but uh, it is recorded, if you don't mind. And uh, people did not say their names, but we can make subtitles, like Robert was telling. We shall make Robert uh, affiliation and so on. And of course, we shall show. And uh, I, I guess that we, we definitely give a link and uh, ask them to give feedback. Probably for them, Humboldt Foundation always appreciates uh, feedback. We have gatherings and so on. I think probably some. F it's some in initiative which comes from bottom. It was not initiated by Humboldt Foundation, so we hope the Humboldt Foundation will appreciate this uh, initiative, and probably it might also have some influence in planning or whatever. Memories, some um, history of Humboldt Foundation, I think that was very interesting stories about from old times and uh, also new times. Yeah, thank you. And Robert, you mentioned, uh, yeah, the uh, situation in Eastern Europe has changed now and uh, there's not so much need now to bridge gaps anymore. But then on the other hand, I mean, there's uh, really many countries worldwide now that are developing scientifically ra very rapidly that did not really do uh, lots of science maybe 10, 20 years ago. And I mean, I would feel that people from those countries still benefit tremendously from programs where they come into countries that have a longer, longer tradition into science. So I don't know, do we have somebody here who feels he's coming from a country who ha that does not have long history in science and has something to say about that? Maybe not, or maybe any other comment? Any other experience to share? Maybe from the panel? Okay, so I want to maybe to say something about this. Okay, I, I would I, I wanted to being avoid this this personal story of me to to, to, to close to to obtain to, to, to say it very uh, with with details. But me is also of some interest and and uh, is a proof how I would say flexible Humboldt Foundation was. So 
when I applied for the uh, for the fellowship uh, together with uh, my host Fritz Hacke. So it was particularly bad time in Poland to 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 to, to apply for something. Like but in '83 or something like that, you have to plan it uh, uh, um, f uh, well ahead. Okay, everything. And obviously, it was uh, at that time it was clear that that uh, that uh, I would be allowed. I would be allowed to to to, to go to to Germany. Uh, for Alexander von Humboldt, uh, essay, Alexander von Humboldt fellow, the chances were, were very low. So I think this was a special strategy, uh, which uh, was a negotiation between Humboldt Foundation and Fritz Hacke. So the, the solution was the, that the Fritz Hacke himself wrote me a five pages invitation when there was written what were, what, what were our plans of work and something like that. And somewhere in the middle of the third page it was written that I, I would be financed by Alexander von Humboldt. So I think that even overzealous bureaucrats from, from Poland didn't come to this place, so, so it somehow, so it somehow it worked. And the second thing was that for some, I don't know what were the reasons at that time, uh, that uh, Alexander von Humboldt, as probably you know, founded also language courses. And for some, uh, some reasons which are completely unknown for me, Goethe Institute, which is the, the place of choice for such, a, was not well, I would say, seen by, by, by Polish government, Polish, Polish authorities, okay? So they switched this to some private school in Marburg, which was very good, actually, also, which has nothing to do with Goethe Institute, and some, uh, somehow it also somehow worked, okay? So nobody had the same. And uh, I want also to say something about this, uh, what, from, which, from what I started, so that, that for me this uh, being Alexander von <coughs> Humboldt Fellow gave me the opportunity to meet several uh, groups and several, several people. And uh, I want to say that this is the second Humboldt Collect which I'm uh, taking part this year. And the first year had nothing to do with physics, okay? So just because of this Humboldt connection, I was asked, uh, there was a Humboldt colleague in Warsaw organized by linguists, actually. They were interested, actually, at the, how uh, German and English uh, interplayed, uh, or how it changed, so naming and, and the nomenclature, this, this everything which goes with naming uh, phenomena and something like that from German to English and how it really started then, 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 then um, in physics we use mostly English but also German and when it started, not that I'm a specialist but I, at least I understood what is the what is uh, what what this what is the meaning of all these names? So they asked me to explain this how it evolved, and then there is especially this uh, the, the department of uh, so-called modern linguistics which organizes this in Warsaw. It has two subdivisions: English and German. So for them, it was especially interesting to compare how it how it works. And this was just because they found me as a as the Alexander von Humboldt fellow who is a physicist, okay, so, so good, who, who can explain to them some of the things. Okay. I can add also that once I was invited to, I think it probably was a big meeting of uh, Polish Humboldtians, it was not a Humboldt. I don't know why I was invited, but they somehow invited me, and it was uh, quite political, like uh, political speeches, so there was not, no, not much physics, but a great uh, opportunity to visit uh, Warsaw and to meet other Humboldtians. Yeah. So I think we moved on a little bit from the idea of getting a fellowship and moving somewhere to opportunities that arose uh, later uh, through connections uh, with Humboldt. Is there some more experience on that? Some meetings that uh, had a long lasting impression on you?
Nothing in that direction? First Humboldt colleague for everybody? Maybe uh, Robert already started to push a little bit into that direction. Uh, expectations that you would have from Humboldt. So we heard quite some about experiences uh, 20 years ago. Many things have changed in the meantime. Are there any ideas uh, that you think this is something that you would like to have from Humboldt or a direction that one could potentially move into? So maybe I can tell about follow-up programs. Of course, as you know, Humboldtians is uh, Humboldtians for life. One can extend fellowship, but there is also one another interesting opportunity which I took advantage is institutional collaboration. Because as I mentioned, my Humboldt fellow was initially 97, 98. But around 2003, I decided to make a Humboldt constitutional collaboration with Michael Fleischhauer and University of Kaiserslautern. And it's good that it can be for three years and you can get up to 50 or 55,000 euros for travel, for some equipment, which actually stimulates, you can go in both directions, organize, actually organize the workshop. Um, and it's also good that you can establish new, new collaboration. So as a result, we had some papers which are, are pretty influential, like there was, a, I don't remember in whose, probably Nigel Scooper was a paper by uh, first office Rosatskas and uh, uh, than me and uh, yeah and uh, actually and this paper was uh, uh, yeah it was as a result of this Humboldt institutional collaboration uh, project yeah and also we benefited uh, uh, to a large extent with uh, discussions of another Humboldtian Razmik Unanian because it was tripod scheme and Razmik was a pioneer in a tripod scheme for tripod stir up and published papers in 98, 99. Benskis, who was a Humboldt fellow with uh, a Klaus Bergman, also at Kaiserslautern. So, in Kaiserslautern, was a very um, fruitful uh, for co uh, coherent control, and actually, it was moved to me to this area. Yeah. So, maybe uh, are there any uh, other Humboldtians who took advantage of Humboldt institutional collaborative grants? Maybe? Okay, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Genko Genov, and I come from Bulgaria. And uh, um, my my supervisor in Bulgaria, Nikolai Vitanov, uh, uh, had uh, such a collaborative grant with one university in Darmstadt. So my first experience with Humboldt was uh, in 2012, and I came for a research stay with him because of this collaboration. So. Uh, just that is something that people could use in principle to bring their PhD students to other groups in Germany uh, through such uh, collaborations and uh, that experience allowed me to afterwards apply for a Humboldt and uh, I think it helped a lot to get a Humboldt fellowship because I already had such uh, an experience and uh, yes uh, for me that was quite this fellowship was quite useful because I could continue my academic development and I also could learn a lot about way how people work in Germany and uh, finally because I could hear your opinions about your lives and your careers and your experience and that is quite useful. Thank you. Are there any more experiences in that direction regarding institutional Corporations? Um, I also noticed that most of the comments were actually uh, from people from Eastern Europe. So I would say in terms of uh, geography, it was a very unbalanced meeting. Do we have comments from people outside Europe? Oh, Andre, you were you were you were the one. Yeah, you were the one. 
No, you two, two, two of them. But still, I do think it was very European slash Eastern European based. Sorry? So otherwise, if there's no urges to contribute something more, I think we thank everybody, everybody for being here. And